everyone. Welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, we're tackling a topic that might feel familiar to folks. <laughs> How do satellites work? Why does it seem eerily familiar to me? Well, Luke, if you think back to episode 72 of your favorite podcast, Unprofessional Engineering, you would find two very handsome, funny, intelligent people. This was you and your with... previous host. No, no, no. No, th no, no. This would be one Luke and James talking about satellites. Okay, Episode I'm doing 72. I'm doing an early rant. So James is always like Rain Man when it comes to the episodes. I'd be like, hey, what about this one? And instantaneously, no, we did it. We did it. We did it. Don't you remember, dummy? And I said satellites. I'm not was, nice about it either. No, you're never nice about it. You're usually rude and inconsiderate whenever you <laughs> reply back to me. But you were like, oh, yeah, satellites sound good. We'll do that in first robotics because that's the other one. Make sure you listen to that when it comes out. Um, and somehow your steel trap of a brain didn't rem like I have an excuse, James. I'm old. You have no reason to have the memory that you have right now. I know I Jerk. I could come up with some excuses, but we won't get into that on the keep, air. Keep on listening, people, because we discovered a whole slew of additional information about satellites. So I'm sure so much additional information. And if not, check out episode 72 on satellites and see the things that we contradict ourselves on during this one, <laughs> which may happen. Luke, moving on. Technically, a satellite is any object, any object a moon, that perhaps. moves. Yeah, around a planet. the planet. Yeah, yeah the moon. Right? Anything that orbits. That yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being sarcastic. I'll, I'm done with you're my very, sarcasm. You're snarky it's, today. It's anything that orbits something else. There you go. The moon is the Earth's original satellite, Luke. Mm hmm. So that said, today we're talking about actual satellites, not these like yes. made up planet moon garbage satellites. The garbage, I guess, could be a satellite. We're talking about those ones that are used for like communicating, like broadcasting television or weather or navigation, all the important ones that help us live our lazy lives. What do you think? Yes. Okay. A little bit of history? I think we definitely need some history. Okay, so if you want to hear the history, go back to episode 72. <laughs> <laughs> no, real quick, real quick. So 1957, October 4th, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, which was the first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth. It was a whopping 23 inches in diameter, I suppose, and it weighed 184 pounds. It contained a thermometer, a battery, a radio transmitter that had beeps and boops and bops, kind of like R2-D2, mm -hmm. and nitrogen gas, gas to pressurize the interior of it. And that was what was in it. Um, it also had like these like whip kind of tentacles coming out, mm -hmm. antennas to transmit the different information back home. Um, not so, so, this, fun so this wasn't the one they put the dog in. But that was my not so fun fact. A month later, the Soviets were like, you know what's even better than this ball that we're sending in space? A ball with a dog in it. Oh. And so they blasted the dog, Laika, Laika. Laika, off into space. Poor baby sweet pup. I don't, I don't know how old she was, but you know, I assume she never came back. Uh, yeah, not, not alive. I think a re-entry was probably pretty bad for her. Um, probably. So um, my fun, it's more of like an interesting fact. So uh, the movie Rocket Boys, if you, uh, Homer, I forget his last Simpson. name. No, no, he became, no. Uh, he became an engineer um, that worked on some of the first space stuff. Um, Homer, Homer Hickam, it's a story of Homer Hickam. It's called Rocket Boys. The, how am I remembering this? Oh That's, my goodness. You can't remember we did an episode on satellites, <laughs> but you know, Homer Hickam. All so right. Homer Hickam, I forget who he was. He was somehow related to this. I think he ended up working for NASA. But uh, when he was in like his high school, uh, we just did a thing on... Um, uh first robotics he and his friends got all into like model rockets and and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger check out our episode on model rockets exactly that I know we did. 
<laughs> and uh, d- there's a scene in the movie where they're out in the field, mm-hmm. and this was right when Sputnik launched, and like all the Americans were super nervous that Sputnik was like a spy satellite, like no one really knew what satellites were then. And in the video, in the movie, they show it passing over like in the night sky. You could actually see it like doing the beep, bops, and boops, and blinking as yeah. it passed over. So it was, it was an interesting scene. Cool. Yeah. How interesting is it that it's like nobody knew what it was is a spy satellite and really it was like this useless piece of garbage, <laughs> like at least by today's standards, yeah. right? That's funny. Um, it took until the end of January in 1958 for the US to finally match the Soviets by launching the Explorer 1. Um, and it was used to detect cosmic rays. And they actually learned a lot from it being launched out there. That's the full history that I put out There's there. There's no other history on satellites Nothing other has than ever that happened. All of the other then. history is in episode 72. So I just wanted to do a quick one on that. Oh. But what I wanted to cover next, Luke, is What's in the box? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff in the box. Oh, isn't there's there? so much stuff in the box. Do you want me to talk about the box or do you want Please, to? You can start and I'll add in. All right. So first off, it's not technically a, a, a box. Sometimes but... it's shaped like a box. Sometimes. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, but you miss a seven reference if you don't scream what's in the box. <laughs> um, a body. So usually a metallic or composite body, which is known as the bus. Why is it known as a bus, Luke? Because things connect to it like an electrical bus, right? Oh, good. I don't know. I didn't bother looking that up. So yeah, like, I am going with that. Like, like a bus is like one thing that you connect multiple things to. I don't like being near that rubber part of the bus when you're driving and there's <laughs> two of them connected together. That makes <laughs> the me accordion. Yeah, the accordion. Yeah. I don't like that. Um, there's also a power. So it's different. There's a power source. So sometimes this is solar power. But there's yeah, batteries sometimes. that they charge. Of course. Well, there have to be batteries for them to charge and store that power. If you haven't checked out our episode on solar power or on <laughs> batteries, man, we're getting them <laughs> all in here today. A, oh. Go do that. Um, fun fact. Nuclear power has actually been used on probes to other planets. So... That's a little scary to me, but pretty cool. The fact that um, they can make a nuclear, like, I don't know I, how it works. I but... know we, we have to do an episode on that if we haven't done one already. <laughs> nuclear power and satellites. Um, onboard computer systems uh, for monitoring all the stuffs that there is out in space. Whatever they're doing. Um, as well as a radio and antenna uh, to send back all the information about said stuffs. Uh, an altitude control system, also known as an ACS. Um, it. This is to keep the thing going the right direction. Makes sense. And from there, you know, whatever else is in the satellite is kind of r- not random, but based off of the purpose or the goals for that satellite. So maybe it's more weather equipment. Maybe it's more for cosmic ray detection. Maybe it's who knows what um, more for taking pictures, things like that. Um, so it's going to vary. But those are the main things that are on basically every satellite that's out there. Do you have anything else you want to talk about that's on a satellite? Not specifically. I think you got it. Okay. So I have, I mean, where do you want to go next? Mine was so, how do they get into space, but where do you want to go? Let's do that because I have how they, how, what they do in orbit once they're up there. Okay. So how do they get into space? Well, they hitch a ride on a rocket. There you go. So wow, that's that was taken sure. care of. If you want more information on how they get into space, check out episode 72. No, no, Luke. Oh. Uh, so after a rocket is launched pew, straight up into the air, the rocket control mechanism uses an internal guidance uh, system, and that's used to calculate the necessary adjustments for the rocket nozzles to tilt the rocket in the right direction pew, to take on the proper flight path that it's supposed to be on. Fun fact for you, In most cases, the flight plan calls for the rocket to head east because Earth rotates to the east, giving the launch vehicle a little bit of a free boost um, to keep moving more quickly. So the strength of this boost, yeah, the strength of the boost depends on the rotational velocity, which we're going to talk a little bit about, um, of the Earth at the launch location. So the boost is greatest at the equator. So not only does it make sense then for us to be launching stuff from like Florida uh, for weather purposes, but also because, you know, it's that much closer to the equator. I'm sure Pittsburgh would be another great choice if it wasn't for the location, right? (laughs) So once the rocket reaches extremely thin air, which is about 120 miles up yonder, or 
over 190 kilometers for those using that system. Uh, the navigation system fires little tiny rockets, just enough to turn the vehicle into the horizontal position. And then the satellite is released out shoo, into it deploys the, the payload, I think, is what you were wow. looking for. Are you an astronaut? Well, you know. Kind of sounds like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, rockets again are fired to ensure that there's some separation between your rocket, like the launch vehicle, and the satellites themselves. Um, another fun fact for you, Luke. A rocket must accelerate to at least 25,000 39 miles per hour to completely escape Earth's gravity and fly off into space. Was that a fun fact? That's pretty fast. So that said, we don't really want the satellite to leave Earth's orbit. We don't want it to shoot off into no, space. No, no, we don't. Typically, right? So that makes things a little trickier. So orbital velocity is taken into account. This is the velocity needed to achieve balance between gravity's pull on the satellite and the inertia of the satellite's motion. So the satellites want to keep moving, right? We've just pushed them with all, with all this force, they wanna keep moving. So this is this uh, orbital velocity is approximately uh, uh, 17,000 miles per hour when you're at an altitude of 150 miles. Uh, from there, gravity and orbital velocity kind of keep the satellite moving, floating around the earth, just moving and moving. Without the gravity, the satellite flies off into space and that's no good. Even with gravity, if the satellite's going too quickly, it's going to pull away from our gravitational pull and fly off into space. If it's moving too slowly, it's going to get pulled back to earth and smash into a building or an ocean more likely. So, you know, kind of a real fine balancing act between all of this. So the th I have three speeds. I think you may have mentioned one or been close. This is from NASA's uh, website. Like they know uh, anything. The low orbit, 27,500 kilometers per hour. Wow. That's the, the, that's the low orbit. Uh, mm -hmm. The middle orbit, this is for like GPSs. Uh, this is 13, they actually move slower the further they go out because... So what was that one? What did you say? So the the, the low orbit is uh, twenty seven thousand five hundred kilometers per hour. Kilometers. Okay, that's yeah. where I was confused. And then the the middle orbit is uh, thirteen thousand nine hundred kilometers per hour. And then the geostationary. This is the really really far super high altitude. These are the, these mm -hmm. are the satellites that look like stars because they're in the they actually orbit at the same or. They're moving at the same speed that the Earth is rotating, so they stay in the same position. They are eleven thousand one hundred kilometers per hour, um, so they appear to never move. Usually, there we go. Uh, before we appear to never move anymore, let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. I'm thinking the sponsor is Unprofessional Engineering, episode seventy-two. <laughs> Why not? We'll go with that. We don't have a sponsor this episode, um, second time through, but we uh, we were going to. NASA was going to yeah. sponsor us until we'd already done it before. We have a couple shout outs. Shout out number one is Jake D. A little less than a year ago, I began to pursue my interest in engineering, and your podcast was the first I came across. I was hooked right away. So much so that I'm currently pursuing a mechanical engineering degree at the University of Buffalo. Best One there caveat, is. though, I already have my master's degree in music performance. As a big decision to go back to college, I'm happy to say that your podcast helped confirm my choice of engineering. So thank you for that. Also so first of all, suggested an episode on the engineering behind a piano. I was just going to say, there's a boatload of engineering that goes into musical equipment and instruments, and I, I, I'm sure that he could take his love for music and engineering combine oh, yeah. it somehow. Oh, for sure. I, I don't know anything about the musics, but I would be happy to learn and do an episode about it. I'm also a little concerned that Jake was like, oh man, these guys know what they're talking about. He's I'm making life an decisions based off of our... <laughs> <laughs> Jake, good luck. Good uh, luck, buddy. Kevin, Kevin B is our second shout out. Love listening to the show. I'm a fellow Pittsburgher, so I especially appreciate all the local shout outs sprinkled nice. into the show. I'm not an engineer. However, I have a degree in anthropology and work as a wildland firefighter on the Hotshot crew, which sounds... And he lives you know, in Pittsburgh? So I wrote back and said that same thing. And I think he 
participated more like in the Rockies or something. Oh, I so he, I he like read goes out response. for a while. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear an episode touching upon anthro engineering, which I didn't know was a thing, or how engineering has impacted the efforts of wildland fire suppression. So there we go. Fire control and suppression could be an interesting one. There's a lot of like, like I don't know if it's engineering. It's probably more civil than anything. Like, well, you know. Yeah. Next time you're coming up with episodes for us to do, instead of picking one we've already done, how about you decide to use wildland fire suppression? Alrighty. If any of you would have any suggestions for episodes that we haven't done already, or maybe one that you want us to cover again because we did a poor job on it, if you want to tell us we're doing a fine job, or if you want to hit up our new unprofessional engineering dun, 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 swag dun. store head over to unprofessionalengineering.com. If you just want to say hi, give us topics, all that stuff, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share. We love the reviews. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. Well done, Luke. What's next? Uh, so we got to talk about how they communicate a little bit, I think. Like, you, you talked about the parts that are in there, but like... You yeah. got these big blocks of metal floating up in space, smashing into each other, causing all kinds all of the time. all kinds of space debris. Mm-hmm. Um, and but like, how do they actually communicate? So, uh, right off the bat, there are three different types of communication services that satellites provide. Uh, the first one, and probably most obvious one, is telecommunications. So you think of you know cell phones, you think of satellite phones. There's actually satellite phones that actually directly talk to a satellite. They don't use towers and other communication devices. They're really expensive. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, the second, is, they, they all use the basic same systems, but the, and then the next one is broadcasting. So think of, you know, TV, di- direct TV is a perfect example. Any, all these people have satellite dishes connected to the sides of their homes. Um, that's typically broadcasting. Um, so it's coming one direction. There isn't information going back typically. So like you're the just, boy band. Yeah. The, okay. One, di- one direction. No. One direction. Uh, <laughs> And then finally, there is data communications. Um, so again, depending on where you know places are located, running fiber optics and running data cables just isn't a, isn't a solution. So you actually have to send data, like actual gigabytes of data, up via a satellite and down via a satellite. Um, so they all do this relatively the same way. Um, there are land or earth stations that uh, exist and these are the satellite dishes the small ones that are on the top of your homes or these could be really big earth-based stations like you see in the movies Um, and it's just a giant satellite dish that sends information up to the satellite the satellite then has uh, components inside of it that take that information they're typically boosting the signal A lot of times they are changing the frequencies so that they don't interfere with other satellite transmissions happening. Uh, And then they essentially beam that information back down to uh, another ground-based receiving station. Because if you think about the way um, satellites work is, it really is line of sight. So if you need to communicate with a satellite and you have an Earth station that is like misses, like you can't see it over the apex of the Earth, like it can only see certain amount of the, mm-hmm. the earth at one time. So it shoots from here, goes up and then hits on another ground location that's below the apex because otherwise they could just do a direct, you know, one-to-one connection. So, uh, so again, transmission and receiving stations. You look confused. Sounds like you're, well, it seems like you're implying that the earth isn't flat, which is really confusing me. <laughs> No. I think, oh, that's I right. Think we you, did an episode. Our flat on episode. Flat. Yeah. yeah flat our flat episode. <laughs> yeah. Our flat episode. Check out our flat earther episode as well. Uh, it is um, not flat. It is not. Okay. Uh, did you have more to go there? No. I mean, that's essentially so the, the, the primary bands, the commercial satellites. So these aren't the Secret Service ones that are spying on you right now in your home, James, <laughs> but just regular tradition. Yeah, they're listening right now. Uh, so C band uh, is lower transmission uh, power. Uh, they have KU band, which is 
uh, for smaller geographic areas. Uh, typically, it's smaller, like mobile equipment. So if you think of like satellite phones, um, then there's uh, KA band. This is higher transmission. So this is uh, like high bandwidth services. So if you live in a place where you can't get internet via a cable coming into your house, you actually have to rely on high speed internet and video conferencing from a satellite, which is crazy expensive from what I understand. Um, and then there's L band, which is for mobile applications. If you're out at sea um, and you need to have like contact. Um, so those are the, the four primary commercial satellite bands that they use. Very well done. Um, so next thing that I wanted to talk about is how much do these things cost? Oh, goodness. Um, they're not it's pretty pricey. They're not cheap. Yeah. So the prices do vary, though, depending on what model you need, right? If you want the luxury satellite, <laughs> the LX, want, yeah, a used one, whatever the case may be. But a lot of the price comes with the equipment that's in there. So I already told you, you know, here's your basics basic package now to get all your upgrades that's where it comes in so like transponders and cameras and computers and and other stuff like that so a typical weather satellite goes for roughly 290 million dollars is that so, it yeah it's a deal um a spy satellite on the other hand you might tack on another hundred or so million onto that for the additional bells and whistles that you get with that package uh, there's also, though, an expense for maintaining and repairing satellites. So companies have to pay for satellite bandwidth, just like cell phone owners do. Mm -hmm. So with our phone paying for our plan, I wonder if you get a satellite free if you sign up for like 20 years or something. Ooh. That would be a deal. Uh, and those bandwidths could cost up to like $1.5 million per year. So again, another pretty big expense. And another important factor for satellite cost is the launch that is associated with. I think it's the most expensive, one of the one of the most expensive parts of it. Yeah, launching a single satellite into space can go anywhere from ten million to four hundred million dollars. Well, that's all on how you're getting them up there. Yeah, well, th that's what SpaceX is all about is like the reusable bit of it. So like previously right. you shoot it up, the thing crashes in the ocean, burns up in the atmosphere and never comes back. That's the whole idea with like, you know, essentially you're just like, you have a truck that's delivering to the space and parking back on the landing pad. I mean, you can a reuse all truck. of it, a space truck. I think do that's what it's called, does, a space truck. Do they still sell that truck, the Tesla truck? Uh, I don't I think, think it ever so sold. God, it was, it was a prototype. Um, oh, okay. So a small launch vehicle, like the Pegasus uh, rocket, it can lift 976 pounds into low Earth orbit for a price of about $13.5 million. Um, the Ariane 5G rocket can lift almost 40,000 pounds into low Earth orbit for only 165 million. So if you got a lot of heavy stuff that you want to get out there, you know. The other deal. thing too, from what I understand, is when they send a rocket to space, they're carrying multiple satellites for oh, multiple yeah. people. Like it's not just they're sending one satellite up at a time. Like it's, you know, you might have James's satellite over here for like really, you know, whatever you want to spy the dark on web. people for, the dark web. Yeah. Um, and then you have like other satellites for weather communication or whatever it happens to be. So it, there's multiple satellites per launch on almost all occasions, I think. Yeah, I'm going to talk about SpaceX and the Starlink soon, but they just like crapped out like 40 satellites at one time and most of them all failed. But that's <laughs> beside the point. Um, before we do that, though, Luke, let's take a break for this week's second Luke's rant. Yeah, so uh, this is a continuation of James uh, <laughs> not remembering that we Seriously? already kind of did this episode. But you don't, you know, folks, you don't always listen to hear the details. It's the it's the banter. It's the back and forth. It's the the humor. It's the it's the chop camaraderie. It's the camaraderie and the, the chop love. busting, the love, whatever you want to call it. But I do have to admit, James, a, a bit of my rant is. Um, I think this is the beginning of the end for you and your mental senility or whatever that's called, your memory. Like I thought you were calling an end to the podcast, but no, you're just no, worried about my no, mental you're, well being. You're, yeah, like so I have an excuse for like so I have a notoriously bad memory. And I've read books, I've done meditation, I've taken like herbal supplements and all these things are supposed to help you with memory, ginkgo biloba and all these other crazy things that are supposed to help with memory. Nothing works. I have a terrible memory. And apparently it's contagious because 
This is, you're usually crazy sharp with like everything. I'll, I'll give you some kudos. You're a pretty Thanks, intelligent man. person. This is one of the first times where I'm going to say you definitely dropped the ball on this. I really let you down. You I did. do. I take full responsibility, Luke. Uh, it is definitely my fault that you suggested an episode <laughs> that we already did and that I didn't remember that we had it covered uh, and that I caught this memory issue from you. So Accurate. Thank uh, you. I, I will take the blame. Thank and you. I, I appreciate the kudos, though. That was nice. It was like... It was like you're great, but that's a that's yeah. It's, it's, that's how that, all my reviews go. Is that too. called you're a doing a great job? But <laughs> is that a backhanded compliment? Right? Is that yeah, what I just I think did? So I think so. I don't do them very it. often. That was pretty good. No, it's usually just all backhanded. <laughs> um, so the next thing, and the only other thing, other than some fun facts that I have to talk about, is SpaceX. Do you have anything else you wanted to cover? Uh, I just want to talk a little. I have a few. Okay, I, I have a couple fun facts, and we can wrap up with SpaceX and some of the last things. So, All right, um, let's hear it. Uh, so, uh, fun fact: satellites, as far as we know, never have collided other than one time. And it's recent. So in February 2009, two satellite, uh, two sat communication satellites collided. One American, one Russian collided in space. This is believed to be the first time ever two man-made satellites ever collided uh, accidentally. Uh, hmm. It's interesting they say accidentally because I'm assuming that in some cases maybe they smashed them together. They on smashed purpose. them on purpose. Uh, I imagine there could just be debris. You know, there could be you know meteorite or like other space junk floating around. The other thing too is these were active satellites. So I think oh. once satellites are decommissioned, in a lot of cases they just shut them off and they drift out in the space and you know aliens think that we're bombarding them or something like that. But I imagine probably. that there's probably decommissioned ones that may have collided because there's currently 4,550 satellites orbiting the Earth right now. So how can they not run into each other? It's a lot. I mean, space yeah, is big, but it's not infinitely big. Or is space I mean, infinitely big? Wow, that's a deep question. Ooh, ooh, now we're getting into something. Wow. Do you have more fun facts for us? That's all I got. You want me to rattle a few off? Please. When sending stuff to space... Space junk is involved, Luke. There are 100 million pieces of orbital debris, no larger than one centimeter. There's 500,000 pieces that are one to 10 centimeters. And there's about 21,000 items larger than 10 centimeters. So those are the ones you got to watch out for. Um, they track it, apparently. I saw a map one day they do. of what it looked yeah. like. I don't know how they do that, but good for them. Um, there's two satellites in orbit around the earth that are chasing each other. And Ooh. NASA uses these for tracking gravitational anomalies. Like if something happens to one and not the other, right? Oh. They're nicknamed Tom and Jerry. Oh, so I thought that's that was fun. funny. Yeah, I wonder if the, a the younger listeners fact. remember no Tom and Jerry. Uh, they don't watch Tom and Jerry nowadays, way too violent. Yeah, you mentioned uh, meteorites. Satellites are not destroyed by meteor meteorites because they're programmed to avoid them if they're active still. Only one has been destroyed to date out of more than 8,000. So that's pretty good. Um, they've taken pictures in high resolution from satellites of more than 3,100 Egyptian settlements, 17 pyramids, and 1,000 tombs. That's pretty cool. Uh, there's a satellite orbiting the Earth that's going to re-enter the atmosphere in 8.4 million years, carrying a message to the humans of the future. Right on time. Yeah. And then a satellite failed in 1998 at eight <laughs> and 80% of the pagers in the world stopped working when it failed. <laughs> Did you have a then, pager? Then cell phones were invented in a hundred percent of pagers gotcha. failed, but, um, yeah, 80% failed. And I did have a pager one time. We had one customer when I started working like two or three years in that was on the West Coast and I was on an East Coast based company that was so salty that he couldn't get tech support on his time zone for those three hours. Yeah, and I was the one who covered California. So. I do have one last fun fact. Okay. And I think this is I think this is one of those facts that like we're not sure of. So oh. if you watch any spy facts. movies- they they show like real time satellite views of like cars driving and the satellites are watching like like they can look in my window and see what I'm doing. Um, so in the movie, I'm looking in your window right now. You so. probably are. They so they make it look like satellites can just like I can just take over a satellite and like look at someone's house or watch a car. 
I don't know if I, but the government has said on multiple occasions, none of that technology is real. That's just in the movies. We can't do live active tracking of people from space. Like the things they can do is maybe drones and stuff like that, but not, I don't know if I believe them because I feel like, I mean, you're able to send this piece of equipment to space. Like I would think that they would make sure that while it's there, it can do whatever they need it to do, especially like, you know, the government and, you know, CIA and FBI, they're all going to be listening to our podcast now. So I feel like we could do an episode that we haven't already done on like the lies the government tells us or what <laughs> we think are lies like this one. I'm with you. Like, I bet they're tracking me right I, now because I'm yeah. a pretty important person. You just but... said the word FBI. So you're you're <laughs> definitely on a list right now. You said it. I didn't. Um, yeah, I think that would be a fun. Episode. Okay. So we're going to finish um, up with little Elon, the boy. Little Elon, yeah. Our so, friend. Um, thought he was going to sponsor us this episode mm, as well. Turns out maybe he next did time. not. Yeah, but I think the last time we did this, actually, SpaceX, I mean, it was a thing, but maybe it wasn't quite as big of a thing. And Starlink certainly wasn't quite as much of a thing. So this is the famous satellite internet constellation um, aiming to provide high-speed internet around the globe especially for like the rural and more re remote locations out there. So like people like my parents that live in the middle of nowhere should be getting this for high speed internet. I think they still have dial up in St. Louis. Oh. Uh, so as of February 3rd of 2022, so this is five weeks ago, SpaceX had launched 2,091 Starlink satellites with more of them to be on the way. Um, so in order to offer satellite services over any uh, like nation, the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU regulations and longstanding uh, international treaties are required that landing rights be granted to each country. So it's kind of limited where they're allowed to be operating at this point. Um, Starlink Network has already near global reaches at latitudes below 60 degrees. Um, but the service can only be provided to 29 countries as of March 2022. So uh, if you go to like Wiki or maybe even their webpage, they'll give you a list of the different places that it's available. Um, in North America, the United States and Canada both have access. Um, and most of these are all like in public beta. So like the US and Canada, the UK, Germany, New Zealand, Australia, blah, 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 like a whole bunch of countries, 29 of them. And also added as of February 22nd in response to the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine was Ukraine added to that list. So it was just added along with Brazil and Bulgaria to places that are able to access this. And so, did you see how it was added? How crazy it was? The, the tweet you mean? So uh, like one of the defense ministers or someone on the Ukrainian parliament or someone in the president's inner, cir inner circle sent a tweet and tagged Elon Musk about, hey, can we get Starlink because our internet has been cut off because of the invasion? And uh, like literally like Elon Musk tweeted him back and was like, oh yeah, I'll turn it on for you. And and, and I've, flips a switch like and then I've seen a handful of like tweets and pictures because I've been kind of following it. It's everything that's in the news right now. Um, yeah. And uh, they showed these little satellite dishes that were delivered to the Ukraine that are Starlink satellite dishes that they're going to be able to use to have high speed Internet for whatever the communications they need during, you know, this uh, this time of invasion and unrest. So. That's fantastic. Um, well, good for Elon. Um, doing that that was nice of him hopefully hopefully this all ends soon so that yeah they don't have to depend on that um so on that somber note um do you have anything else you wanted to cover no that's it i just this this was a good one even the second time around james for those of you that listened in we have a free offer for you no just kidding um <laughs> um i don't remember any of the last ones so this is great for me it was is... i think like four years ago that it went live so you know Everyone probably has forgotten. So this so, is a good refresh. So interestingly, I, I left it out of my rant, but we were talking in between shows that we forget so much of what we've talked oh about. Goodness. Like yeah. if if I could remember half of what I've researched, even though it's mostly wrong research, according to our listeners, um, <laughs> like if I could remember half of it, like I would I would be like a be genius. So smart. I, yeah. I just I can't remember if, if I'm not reading it, it's not in there. So I hear you. Well, 
Reminder to everyone, a reminder to everyone, we have the Unprofessional Engineering store available at unprofessionalengineering.com. Head on over there for your t-shirts, your sweatshirts, your socks, your underwear, your stickers, your water bottles, who knows what might be on there coming soon. Um, if you have any suggestions, let me know and I can add them on there. Um, otherwise, hopefully you all enjoyed this. You learned something about satellites that we hadn't covered before. And until next time, see ya.